Would you turn with me for one final time in this series to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. These are the words of God. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they may go and anoint him. And very early, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. The entrance of the tomb. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. These are the words of God. What does the ending of a story communicate? What's the significance of the ending of a story? It could be a few things, right? For if you think of an action movie, how does your normal action movie end? It, it ends with your main characters who just finished a grand adventure, sitting down to rest, and then one more, one more trouble comes, and all of a sudden there's another adventure. What does that communicate? The story just keeps on going. And, and maybe there's a setup for a sequel here also. And a love story, how does that end? It, it ends with the man and the woman who have often been struggling through misunderstandings and conflicts with one another, finally married. And what does that communicate? Finality. Peace. Joy. Or in a horror movie, the, the ending often comes with a sense of something being unresolved, something being unfinished and in an unnerving way, right? Maybe the bad guy is still alive at the end, or there's eerie questions left unanswered. What does that communicate? Dread, fear, hopelessness, right? The ending of the story is significant because the ending of the story tells us how we're meant to think about all of the story, and it tells us how we're meant to feel about all of the story. And as we come to the ending of Mark's gospel here, we find a strange and unexpected ending. Jesus is risen, but the disciples are afraid. Does that feel anticlimactic to you? Is that, is that the ending you were expecting now, you might be hearing me, though, and you say, uh, what do you mean by the ending, Josh? You look, you look down at your Bibles, and you see Mark ending not in verse 8, as I read, but instead going all the way to verse 20. Now, if you look back down to your Bibles again, you'll probably see a note or a footnote like I have in my Bible here. Look down at it with me. It says this, at the end of verse 8, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. How does that make you feel? Now, I think, I think if we're being honest, a note like this might make us feel confused or unsettled or even a little bit shaken. What are we meant to make of this note? Now, if we're, we're going to answer that question, first we need to understand how we received our Bible. So, would you... Journey with me back in time to days before YouTube and Telegram and copy and paste. How did people communicate to others that they weren't physically present with? They did it by writing things down on something called papyrus. 
Papyrus was a kind of fabric. Now, what do we know about fabrics? Fabrics are easily destroyed. The things spill on them. They get saturated. They get moldy. They get tears. But that's all that people had, right? And that's, that's what everyone wrote on. Everyone wrote on this thing called papyrus. Just to use three examples, Plato, Aristotle, and Homer all wrote on papyrus. And do you know how many copies of their work we have today because of that? For Plato, we have only seven copies of Plato. Would you believe that? For Aristotle, we have only eight copies. And for Homer's The Iliad, we have 643. And these copies that we have of their works, we don't have them anywhere close to the time that they were written either. Rather, the earliest copy of Aristotle that we have is 1,400 years after he wrote. But that's all that people had. They had papyrus. They had fabric. That's the best they could do. That's what everyone wrote on. And when we come to the Bible, that's what Paul wrote on. That's what John wrote on. That's what Peter wrote on. And that's what Mark himself wrote on. On top of that, do you remember, how how was Christianity received in the first century? Were the, the Romans, were they friends of the Christians? By no means. No, no. We, we find Nero Caesar, do you know what he did with Christians? He would take Christians, he would dip them in tar, he would put them on a stake in his garden and light them on fire as lanterns. No, the Romans hated Christians. So you know what the Romans did when they would find a copy of the Bible? Destroy it. They would destroy it as quickly as they could. And the disciples of Christ themselves are a prime example of this persecution. You know how Peter was crucified? Upside down. Simon was burnt alive. Thomas was pierced through with spears. And Mark, the author of our gospel, do you know how he died? He died with a rope tied around his neck, being dragged through the streets until he died, some two to five years after he finished writing this gospel. And this persecution of the church, it would last for the first 260 years of the church. The Romans destroyed any copy of the Bible they could find. They killed Christian. And you know what the penalty for owning a Bible was? Death. Death would come if you owned even half of a letter of Paul. My goodness, you're dead. Do you know how the New Testament spread then? It spread... As regular Christians, regular Christians like you and like me under penalty of death and often at night and by candlelight where they would get a copy of the Bible and do you know what they would do? They would write it down and they'd wonder, is someone going to come through that door? Because if they do, I'm dead. And then, and then when someone would come and visit them, they'd say, hey, I, I have this. Do you want to take a copy down yourself? Christians who who loved Jesus and loved his word so much that they were willing to face death just like those apostles. Christians who could say with David, Psalm 119, 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. And then in October of AD 312, something completely unexpected happened. Constantine. The emperor of Rome, do you know what happened to him? He became a Christian. And then early the very next year, he produced an edict, the Edict of Milan. And do you know what that said? It stopped all Christian persecution. Oh my goodness, the Christians had a wonderful opportunity in front of them now. Because this was formerly illegal, owning these documents was once illegal, and so, do you know what they did? They gathered up all of these fragments of papyrus to say, we, we need to make an official Bible here so this can be passed down more easily and more faithfully and more readily. And do you know what happened in God's providence around this exact same time? Papyrus, uh, was, invented, or, uh, papyrus was replaced by parchment. Papyrus was replaced by parchment, and this wonderful thing that maybe you've heard of it, books were created as well. In God's providence, then all of the pieces were coming together, and and the Christians gathered up all of these fragments, the fragments the Romans tried to destroy, and these little manuscripts, they gathered them together, and within 20 years of the persecution ending, 
The Christian church had an entire New Testament compiled as a book and an entire Bible compiled as a book as well. The first, all 66 books of the Bible that you have in your Bible in front of you right now were in those documents. Today we call those two documents Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And as a result, do you know how many copies of the Bible or of the New Testament we have today? In Greek manuscripts alone, not including Latin or other translations, we have 5,800 copies. Do you hear that? Plato, how many do we have of Plato? We have seven. Aristotle, eight. Homer, just over 600. The Bible, over six, I'm sorry, over 5,000. So that means amid persecution and and strategic attempts to wipe out all of Christianity, the Bible is the most well-attested document in antiquity. God preserved his word is what that means. So that's the backdrop. How then are we meant to think about these verses at the end of Mark? So the job of the scribes, remember I told you they were collecting these fragments, these manuscripts, and compiling Bibles for us. Their job was to take this papyrus, and their job was the same as modern Bible translators to make sure that what's in your Bible is the words that God said. And both modern scholars and ancient scribes, as they look at all of the evidence, this is what they say about this text. They say that verses 9 through 20 were not written by Mark. Today, faithful, conservative Christians, okay, real believers, Scholars have concluded these verses were not written by Mark for three reasons. And number one, the earliest manuscripts that we have of Mark's gospel do not include verses 9 through 20. That this includes both the papyrus fragments, remember from the persecution, from the persecution they don't include these, as well as Codex uh, Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, those two documents, those first two Bibles of the early church I mentioned. Number two, the earliest church fathers who wrote sermons on the gospel of Mark. Do you know what? As you read their sermons, they're going along just like we've been preaching through here, and they get to chapter 16, verse 8, and then their sermons stop. Why might their sermons stop? Because they did not have verses 9 through 20. And lastly, our two best church historians, our ancient church historians of the 4th century, Jerome and Eusebius, both of them say that the oldest and the best manuscripts they have do not include verses 9 through 20. So where did they come from? Where did, where did these verses come from then? If everyone's saying that Mark did not write these verses, where did they come from? Well, the earliest witness we have to this long ending of Mark comes from a gospel harmony. Do you know what a gospel harmony is? A gospel harmony is where you have on one page, not you don't flip from Matthew to Mark to Luke to John. Rather, you have laid out on a single page the same story told by different gospel writers. So you might have on one page the story of Jesus' temptation, as told by Matthew, as told by Luke, as told by Mark, all on one page. Then you might turn the page and you have the story of Jesus' baptism, as told by Matthew, as told by Mark, as told by Luke, all on one page, and so on throughout the life of Jesus. So you just have these stories laid out next to each other. So then, scholars think about how how do we get this longer ending of Mark, and they tend to believe that some very well-meaning scribe got to the end of verse 8 and thought, this is quite a strange way to end it. And, and these other gospel accounts give us a great commission, and they talk about post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and Mark doesn't. And so they said, what if we tried to ease out this ending of Mark's gospel? Look at, look at verse 8 with me again. You might do the same if you got to the end of this. And they went out and fled the tomb, and trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's quite a strange way to end your gospel, isn't it? So what if instead we we took some sections from Matthew, and we took some sections from Luke, and we took some sections from John, and maybe some stories from the book of Acts, and we put them at the end here. And throughout this section, we do have quotations from those gospels, as well as from the book of Acts. 
So, so while these verses fill in details more about what would happen after uh, verse 8, we, we have no reason, we have no reason to believe the promises about being bitten by snakes or drinking deadly poison or speaking in tongues were ever spoken by Jesus. Now, now many of you, many of you were told, okay, that if you do not speak in tongues, that you are not a true Christian. Now, I believe in the gift of speaking in tongues. I believe that I've been given the gift of speaking in tongues. However, we do not believe that Jesus said these particular words. And no inspired text of Scripture, no inspired text of Scripture says that you must speak in tongues to be a true Christian. No, no, instead, the mark of a true believer has always been and always will be faith in Christ alone. So, so why are these verses in our Bibles at all then? Uh, why, why put a footnote at all? Why not just remove them entirely and not leave us wondering questions about our Bibles? Well, there's, there's actually two reasons, and I think that those two reasons should give you great confidence in your Bibles. They give me great confidence in my Bible. First, because many of the manuscripts which don't include these verses have been recent discoveries for the church. Codex Sinaiticus, which I've mentioned a few times, was not discovered until the 1800s. And so the modern church has not been aware of these shorter endings to Mark's gospel until recently. And here's what we find. When we find older manuscripts which attest to a shorter ending, do you know what we consistently find? we find that the verses in our Bibles match those older manuscripts. Okay, so picture this with me, okay? If you find, if you find a document that's written 500 years, maybe you find a, a sermon from Michael that's copied down 500 years after he preached it, and you think, wow, this is wonderful. These are Michael's words. It was a bit of a long sermon, though. I guess Michael preached quite long sermons. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I have a lot to get done today, guys. I have a lot to get done today, so have mercy on me. And then you find another manuscript, a copy of Michael's sermon, that includes a little bit less information. What's more likely? What's more likely? That earlier document, okay, that that earlier document forgot to include some things or that someone added some things more later. What we find consistently is that scribes would add more information to clarify information in the Bible. So this is what that means, the job of putting together our Bibles. Okay, it's like putting together a 10,000-piece puzzle. It's like putting together a 10,000-piece puzzle, and the difficulty that scribes and scholars have is not that they only have 9,000 pieces to the 10,000-piece puzzle, it's that they have 11,000 pieces to the 10,000-piece puzzle. Because scribes will sometimes add material to clarify things, but they won't take verses out. Do you remember how the Bible spread under persecution? There was never a time then when a church or a government controlled the transmission of the Bible text. No pope and no king were in charge of the Bible and what verses were in and what verses were out. They couldn't be because that's not how the Bible spread. They spread as regular Christians like you and me copied down Bible verses. So when we find an ancient manuscript, one in Turkey and one in Egypt and one in Rome and one in Israel, and they all say the same thing, we have great confidence in our Bibles. Because it's never been possible for anyone to remove verses out of the Bible. It's never been possible. Second then, second, there's a tradition. There's a tradition going all the way back to the early church. That to include these verses in our Bibles with a note. In fact, would you believe it, the 30 earliest Greek manuscripts we have of Mark's gospel all include a note just like this. They end it at verse 8, and then they say, our best manuscripts don't include verses 9 through 20. Now, that should give you great confidence, because you know what they would do? They would not remove even questionable verses. They would just put a note there, because they did not want to take anything out of the manuscripts that would be passed down to the next generation. That should give you great confidence in your Bible. So when you see notes like this, you stand in a long line of Christians who have done the same. Christians who love their Bibles, Christians who care about their Bibles, Christians who want to know what the words of Jesus are, 
No, no, no. This is how, this is not an indication we can't trust our Bibles. This is how God preserved his Bible for us. All the way from when Mark wrote it. From one generation to the next, as faithful Christians copied what they had been told. So, so this should not stake our faith. Instead, it sh- this sh- notes like this should bolster our confidence and fill us with great joy because we have confidence. The words written down in our Bibles are the words that Mark himself wrote. And we have confidence because what God promised is true. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Indeed, my friends, he has preserved his word. And when you're reading your Bible, you're reading the very words of God himself. They are preserved for us, and you can stand with confidence on them. With that said, enough with the history lesson. Let's move to the inspired, infallible, and errant ending of of Mark's gospel, written by the Holy Spirit himself in verses 1 through 8. And as we do, I believe, I believe that the Lord desires to come to us in our failures, to comfort us with his gospel, and to call us once again to follow him. Because the only hope, the only hope for fallen disciples is a risen Savior. The only hope for fallen disciples is a risen Savior. Let's let's first consider the fallen disciples, shall we? Let's start in verses 1 through 2. These are the words of God. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. So after Jesus' death, these three women go to Jesus' tomb early in the morning, and they go to anoint his body, and right away we are met once again with a great awareness that these are not perfect disciples. They have fall and they fail just like us. Jesus has told his disciples time and time and time again that he will die and three days later he will rise, but these women have forgotten. Or if they haven't forgotten, they just don't believe. And as a result, as a result of them not believing what Jesus said, they are going to mourn the death of Jesus. They prepared for Lexobate. But but not just the lexobate of Jesus, the lexobate of all hope, the lexobate of all salvation. Can you imagine how sorrowful Friday night was as I saw their Lord crucified and buried? Can you imagine the utter hopelessness that they felt all day on Saturday as the Lord laid silent in the tomb? And can you imagine their tears on Sunday morning as they went to anoint Jesus? All because they forgot about the promise that Jesus had made. How much sorrow in our own lives is because of this same sin? Our Lord has made precious promises to us in the gospel, which should give us great hope, but at times we don't believe them. And when trial comes, when it appears that all hope is lost, when we forget these promises, we go about mourning. So, My dear Christian, when you sin, Do you carry the burial spices of your salvation around with you? When Christ has promised all forgiveness for every sin you commit, do you forget his promise and do you mourn as if you were damned to an eternity in hell? When you experience hardship, do you carry the burial spices of your joy with you? When Christ has promised to draw near to you in suffering and he's told you that no suffering will separate you from his love, do you go about ready for the funeral of all hope, and mourn as if he's abandoned you. When you experience prolonged suffering, do you go about carrying the burial spices of all of your joy and all of your faith in Christ? When Christ has promised that no matter how much you suffer in this world, he will personally return and he will make all things right and he will wipe away every tear from your eyes and you will see his face and in his presence is fullness of joy. Do you forget this promise and mourn as if this hardship will last forever? Did you know 
that the source of much of the deep sorrow in your life is not much different than these women. When our eyes are turned away from our Savior and we forget His gospel, and we turn our eyes instead to our suffering and to our sin and our circumstance, and we find ourselves drowning in sorrow, well, they, they mourn because they forgot Jesus. They, they forgot the gospel, but do you know what the wonderful news is? Even though they had forgotten that Jesus said he would rise, Jesus was still risen, whether they believed it or remembered it or not. Here's the point then. How much you believe the gospel has no bearing on the truthfulness of the gospel, but it has much bearing on your experience of suffering. Okay? It has no bearing on the truthfulness of the gospel, but it has much bearing on your experience of suffering. Had they believed this truth, imagine what those three days would have felt like and been like. It would have been anticipation. Yes, sorrow, but anticipation for Christ will rise on Sunday. Sorrow and hardship will come. But there's a kind of sorrow that finds hope in the gospel and another kind of sorrow that leaves you utterly hopeless. Paul describes this when he says this, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. My dear friends, many of you are afflicted. And when you are afflicted, you are crushed. You are driven to despair. Because when hardship comes, you forget the gospel. The gospel gives you great hope among sorrow and bad circumstances. Hope that looks outside of yourself, outside of your circumstances, outside of your sin, to the risen Savior who gives you great hope amid sorrow. Yes, you will sorrow. Yes, you will go through hardships, but hope in Christ means it won't crush you. Job describes this in Job 19. He says this, and we can say this too when we remember the risen Jesus in suffering. I know that my Redeemer lives, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Part of, the, part of faith is trusting in the gospel, in the midst of hopeless situations, and finding in the gospel our joy and hope and strength and and the only true light in the darkness. That's the first description of these fallen disciples, but there's more. Let's look next at verse 3. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? These women, as they, as they near the tomb, they had brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus with, but we have this small relatable note and humorous note as it, it appears the, the biggest challenge for them they had completely forgotten about. Who will roll away the stone? This is funny and relatable, isn't it? But, but it does reveal something far deeper as well. Why, why is there no one to roll this stone away? Why are they alone? Why is there no one to help them? Because Jesus' disciples had fallen away and they were hiding. They had fallen away and they were hiding. In their shame, we could maybe say they got lost. Do these hiding disciples look anything like you after you sin? When when you fall into sin, is your response to run away? To get lost, that's what the disciples did. That they didn't show up when others needed them the most. They allowed their shame, get this, they allowed their shame to have the final say in their lives. This text provides such an interesting perspective on getting lost. Because when you get lost, when you don't show up, where are your eyes? They're on yourself. They're on your shame. They're on your sin. Do you know where your eyes are not? They're not on how much others need you. Do you know what we're thinking here at church when you get lost? Something similar to these women. Who will roll away the stone? (laughs) Who will roll away the stone? You see, there's many stones of ministry here at this church that need to be rolled away, and when you get lost, we wonder, who will roll away this stone? 
We're thinking, who will roll away the stone of children's ministry, of music, of greeting others, of children's ministry, of taking offering, of running the PowerPoint, of children's ministry, of doing scripture reading, of children's ministry? Who will roll away the stone? That There are massive stones that need to be moved in this church. Do, do you know what we're thinking? Do you know what we're thinking when you get lost? We're thinking, we wish you were here. Do you know what we're thinking when you want to get lost and you don't and you still come? We're so glad you came. We're a family. Hey, we're a family, my friends, we're a family of failures who just need Christ. And we want you here with us. We're a family of fallen disciples whose only hope is a risen Savior. There's, there's one more picture of fallen disciples that we should consider. Let's look now at verse 8. So after being commissioned by the young man to share the gospel, this is what Mark records in verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They hear the good news of the resurrected Savior. And they tremble with astonishment. What wonderful, what glorious news. Jesus is risen. The gospel is true. Cancel the lexobate. Hope is alive. But th this verse ends in a strange way, and so does Mark's gospel. Instead of spreading this gospel, fear overtakes these women, and they respond in silence. Haven't they heard that Jesus is alive? How could they do this? Haven't they heard what Jesus even said in Mark 13, verse 27? He will send out his messengers to gather his elect from the ends of the earth. Shouldn't they be expecting gospel victory? Shouldn't they be expecting world domination? Yes, they should, but instead they fear and they say nothing. Now, why might they be afraid? Because they know that if Jesus is alive, then suffering is ahead. They, they remember Jesus saying, once again in Mark 13, they will deliver you to the councils, you will be beaten in synagogues, brother will deliver brother over to death, and father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. The Romans are against them. The Jews are against them. The world is against them. And if the fate of Jesus was, was torture and crucifixion, how much so will that also be true of his followers? And maybe they remember the words of Christ himself in Mark 8, take up your cross and follow me. The call to follow Jesus is a dangerous call. And, and if you've never felt this same fear that the women feel in this text, it might be because you haven't been confronted with the true cost of discipleship, the true call of the gospel. How many false gospels are there in this city that when you hear them, you would never even think about feeling fear like these women did? Instead of a dangerous calling, they offer you comfort. Jesus says that following him means rejection and heartache and death, and they offer you riches. Jesus says that following him means you see him ascend the mount of crucifixion, beaten, mocked, and shame, and you say, where's my cross? Give me my cross. I'm, I'm following him up there. In fact, I will take a thousand crucifixions if it means I'm there with my Lord, because in his presence is fullness of joy. Where's my cross? Give me my cross. But the preachers in this city... How often do they offer you riches and healing when Jesus offers you a cross? That message, and those messengers, don't mishear me, they are antichrist. They are against Christ. These women are afraid because the cost of true discipleship has come before them. And if they go out with the message of a resurrection, Jesus, that's a death sentence. Does fear ever keep you back from sharing the gospel? Fear of shame? Fear of rejection? Fear, fear of failure? Fear of physical harm, maybe even? Do you have friends and family members 
that don't know about Jesus, but you don't share the gospel with them out of fear? Now, now, now don't hear me wrongly. The, these conversations need to be had in wisdom and in the right time and in the right way. But Jesus' opinion about us must be the one that matters more than any other. So, so and, and let me also encourage you, because so many of you are excelling at this. Many of you were invited here by others. How many of you were invited here by Yisakor, by Faisal, by Elroy, by Israel, by Sophie or Yabsaga? You know, so many of you are doing so well. Keep up the good work. And let us follow your example. May many in this city come to know the risen Lord Jesus, and may fear never be what stops us. And these, these early followers of Christ, they look a lot like us, don't they? Failed, fallen disciples. Discouraged when they should be hopeful, hiding when they should be present, afraid when they should be full of courage, and, and say with confidence that we are more than conquerors. In a word, they are fallen and failing. Their sins are so much like ours, are they not? But that should give us great hope, actually. Because if their sins are like ours, that means the solution to their sins is the same as ours as well. And so this text actually confronts us with our failures as fallen disciples, but then it gives us great hope in the risen Savior. Because the only hope for fallen disciples is the risen Savior. So we've considered the fallen disciples. Let's next turn and consider the risen Savior. The hope for these disciples is found in a mysterious young man <laughs> and his wonderful words. Look with me again at verses 4 through 7. And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So as the women approach this tomb, they see something shocking. The stone has already been removed. Then, as the women enter the tomb, they meet a young man sitting inside. And this young man gives them a wonderful message. Now, but, but who is this, white, this young man dressed in a white robe, sitting where Jesus once lie? Now, now, while other gospel writers tell you about angels outside the tomb, Mark skips over any encounters outside the tomb. He's not interested with hap what happens outside the tomb. Instead, he goes inside the tomb. The, the other gospel writers are concerned with angels outside the tomb. Mark takes us inside the tomb where no other gospel writer dare tread. And inside the tomb we find, look at it, not an angel, but a young man. A young man inside the tomb. Who's this young man? If you remember, Michael had a sermon recently, just a few weeks ago, where we saw this young man once before. Do you remember it? It was in a very, very strange text that only Mark records for us. Turn back with me, if you would, to Mark 14, verses 51 through 52. My wife and I, we love mystery movies. This is a mystery, okay? This is a mystery movie. Who is this young man? Look at verse, chapter 14, 51 through 52. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloak about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloak and ran away naked. That's a strange story, isn't it? And, as Michael pointed out, this unnamed man, really, he's a symbol for all fallen disciples. Look again at how he's described. Look again at verse 51. He followed Jesus, but then he ran away from Jesus, just like all the other disciples followed Jesus, and then fled. This is what you should hear. You should hear Jesus saying, follow me. But he ran away in the garden, naked and ashamed. So, so why? Why does Mark include this detail of this 
unnamed fallen disciple. Why not include his name? Well, it's because we're meant to see in this man a symbol of every fallen disciple. That this young man, who, by the way, really existed, he really existed, historical man, really followed Jesus to see what would happen, and he really ran away when trouble came. This man is every failed disciple. This man is me. This man is you. This man is all of us. So then, when we get to the tomb, the young man, which, by the way, these are the only two times that Mark uses this word for one man, this young man in, in his gospel. Now, this young man, this fallen disciple, has been wonderfully restored. We, we see him no longer running. We see him sending out these women to preach the gospel. We see him no longer afraid, but saying to these women, do not be afraid. We see him no longer running from Jesus, but telling these women to follow Jesus. This fallen disciple has been restored, and this fallen disciple has been commissioned. How can that be? How can a fallen disciple be restored? How can a fallen disciple be commissioned? Well, as we follow our mystery movie, we have yet one more clue to look at. We need to look at one more detail. What is he wearing in verse 5? He is dressed in a white robe. A robe so white that even as these women enter into this tomb, this robe is still visible. We've seen bright clothes like this, white clothes like this, only once before in Mark's gospel. Do you remember where it is in Mark chapter 9, where Peter and James and John went to the mountain with Jesus, and they saw Jesus transfigured, and this is what's described of Jesus' clothes. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. This fallen and restored disciple is sitting in Jesus' tomb, dressed in bleached white clothes of Christ himself. He, he's completely restored. It's scandalous, is it not? He's abandoned Jesus in the moment of testing, and he stands now in radiant, sparkling white. He, he's moved from wearing the linen cloth that hardly covered him to being fully clothed in a sparkling white robe. Linen cloth to white robe. How can this happen? How can this happen? Let's look at just one more text and we'll see the answer. Mark himself answers this question. Look back at chapter 15, verse 46. And Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped the linen shroud and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of the rock and he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Do you notice that small detail? You might miss it if you're not paying close enough attention. What is Jesus covered in? A linen cloth. In fact, it's, it's translated here as shroud, but it's the same word in the original describing this young man. Jesus takes that linen cloth and he takes it with him into the tomb. That linen cloth that represented that man's greatest failure, that man's greatest shame, that man's greatest sin, that man's act of running away from Christ, oh, that linen cloth represented for this man everything he did not want to be, and Jesus took that shameful act. He took that shameful act and he buried it with him down in that tomb, never to be seen again. And all that's left is a young man clothed in a white robe, clothed in the righteousness of Christ himself. How can fallen disciples be restored again? Only through this glorious, scandalous, wonderful gospel. This, this gospel that takes the shameful act that you are most ashamed of, your most shameful thoughts, your most shameful feelings, your most shameful fantasies, your most shameful acts, your most shameful fears, your most shameful doubts, and it buries them in the tomb of Christ. So my dear Christian, please hear this. This young man gives you 
great hope for for fallen disciples like me and fallen disciples like you because this white robe means there's no shameful act and there is no sin that Christ did not come to live for and to die for and to bury in his tomb never to be seen again. And there is no act of betrayal so severe that the death, his death on the cross does not cover it and his burial does not hide it forever. That the shameful acts that you and I have committed, do you know where they are in God's eyes? It's still in the tomb never to be seen again, so that Psalm 103 verse 12 is true. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's buried. It's gone. It's removed from God's sight entirely. But but it gets even better. It gets even better because not only did Jesus take this young man's linen cloth into the tomb, but this man has been clothed in white, a a, a robe completely undeserved, pure white, spotless and radiant. This young man has not only had his shameful deeds removed, but this sinful disciple is now dressed in the clothes of the Son of God himself. Uh, A sinful disciple declared declared righteous by nothing but grace and grace alone. His sin is buried in that tomb and he's welcomed with the clothes of a son. That's the gospel. Have you fallen? Have you failed? When the hour of temptation and trial came, did you run from Jesus? Have you, like these disciples, forgotten the gospel? Have you lived in deep sorrow? Have you not been there when your brothers and your sisters needed you? Have you kept silent out of fear when you should have shared the gospel? Dear sinner, if you trust in Christ, he will bury all of your sin and all of your shame in that tomb, and God will never look at it again. And my dear Christian, your sin has been buried and you've been clothed with Christ himself, you need not fear. You need not feel shame. You need not feel guilty. For when heaven looks at you, do you know what they see? When heaven looks at you, what is seen is recorded for us in John, in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7, 13 through 14. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? They are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white by the blood of the Lamb. But that's not the only picture of restoration we see in verses 6 and 7. No, uh, look further with me. The the young man's declaration. He says to them, verse 6, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. This restored disciple, (laughs) this restored disciple now turns to the women and he commissions them. Their their first mission is to gather the fallen disciples, to gather them together again, to restore them the same way this disciple was restored, to share the same grace that they had experienced with these fallen disciples. Now, what, what qualified this young man? What qualified this young man to call these disciples back to Jesus? Not because he had never failed. Not because he was more spiritual. No, what qualified him is that he experienced grace. And so he sends out these women to gather the disciples. And notice what he says. He says this, Go and tell the disciples and Peter. All the disciples had fallen. All of them had run. But but Jesus singles out Peter here. Why does he single out Peter? It was Peter who not only ran from Jesus, but Peter who denied Jesus explicitly. He, He swore that he didn't know Jesus. Do you remember Amani's sermon? He swore he was not a follower of Jesus. So why does Jesus mention Peter by name here? I can think of two reasons. 
Number one, because Peter might not have thought the invitation was for him. Can can you imagine Peter's guilt and shame that he felt in denying his Lord? Can you imagine him hearing that Jesus was gathering his disciples together again? Can you imagine him wondering if this message being delivered him, this message of grace, was for him too? Can you imagine the anxiety that he must have felt, wondering if he would be included? And then can you imagine the great joy that came over him when he not only found that he was included, but his name was written on the invitation? Do you know what qualified him for grace? His sin. Do you know what qualifies you to receive the grace of God? There's only one thing that qualifies you to receive the grace of God. Your sin. Your piety doesn't qualify you. Your fasting doesn't qualify you. Your prayers don't qualify you. Your repentance doesn't qualify you. Your tears do not qualify you. Do you know what qualifies you to be a recipient of grace? Only one thing, your sin. That's all that Peter had, and frankly, that's all that we have too. I wonder if there's someone here who needs to hear this. That that when we hear Peter's name listed here, we can put our own names in there as well. Regather the disciples and insert your own name. My dear friends, there's there's nothing that you have done. This is what Peter's example teaches us. There's nothing that you have done that's so wicked that Jesus does not want to gather you back to himself again. There's nothing. Christ bids you come And not only that, he bids you come and he calls you by name and he says, I want you to come back to me. That's the first reason, because Peter probably thought, of course this isn't for me, but it was. The second reason, why is Peter's name mentioned? Well, probably because those in the early church might not have thought this invitation was for Peter. Can you imagine them reading Mark's gospel for the first time? What what shock must have come over them when Peter's name was mentioned here? Can you imagine the gasp in the audience when they heard Peter's name mentioned? Can you imagine the hyper-Calvinist and the legalist saying, but he denied Jesus, he can't come back. And Jesus calls him by name. You you can hear in Jesus' response to these people, these legalists or these hyper-Calvinists saying there's no way he can be restored. Hear Jesus saying this, you have yet to begin to know the depths of my grace. So dear church, we are a room full of fallen and redeemed sinners. We, We are a room full of the undeserving and may we never hold back from those whom Christ freely welcomes. And if this good news of free grace couldn't get any better, do you see do you see how this young man's words end? Look at them in verse 7. He is going before you to Galilee. What is Jesus calling them to? Himself. He is calling them to himself. He's going before them to Galilee. He's going before them to fellowship with them. Do you know what Jesus' great delight is? To fellowship with fallen, redeemed sinners. Who who is he calling to himself? Not the righteous, not the spiritual, not the religious. He's calling fallen and failed disciples to himself. This meal that we're about to have together. So some of you think about this meal as if you must qualify for it. And you think about some sin you've committed this week or even some sin you committed this morning and you think, I can't come. I'm not qualified. Jesus calls you to come. Jesus has died for your sins and he's buried those sins at, at, the, at this burial and inside that tomb never to be seen again and he welcomes you to his table. Not because you're worthy, but because he's clothed you in a white robe. 
the white robe of his righteousness. So hear this call to gather the disciples as an invitation for you to come and feast on his flesh and come to drink of his blood. Now, some of you are tempted in this moment when communion time comes. I know. You're tempted in this moment to sit in the back. You're tempted to sneak out into the hallway. You're tempted to pretend you need to use the toilet. <laughs> Please don't do that. Christ calls you to come. He calls you to come and receive himself freely. Look at who Christ calls to fellowship with him. Those who had sinned and run away. And he also calls those who, in verse 8, will soon run and hide in fear. He, he calls those who, he's aware of their past sins, but he's also aware of their future sins. He knows they're about to commit a great sin and, and run in fear once again, but he still calls them. Do you know what qualifies you for grace? Your sin. And this is how this book ends. Would you believe it? That's how, that's how this book ends. Not in triumph, not in conquering, not in a great commission, not in a victorious disciples. No, this book ends with fallen disciples. It ends then with the same call that this book began with. Repent and believe the gospel. It ends with an invitation. An invitation to come and follow Christ or really is an invitation to come and follow Christ yet again. This is an invitation to those who have repented and have believed the gospel to repent and believe the gospel again. And again. And again. No, no, no. This is a call to believe the gospel and follow Jesus. Even in the midst of shame. Even in the midst of your sin. It's a call to not look at your sin, to not look at your failures, to not even look at your circumstances or even at your successes, but it's a call to look at Christ and to look at him in your fallenness, to look at him in your brokenness, and once again, repent and believe the gospel. Because the only hope for fallen disciples is a risen Savior. And if you ask my opinion, that's the perfect way to end this wonderful book.